Let us pray. God, in, indeed, we look to you to understand your word, not just the words Jesus spoke today, but the words throughout the Bible that sometimes are, well, perplexing. Help us to understand better. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Why God? Why? Why did you even bother to create us? Why did you bother to create us if you knew that things were going to be so hard, so difficult? A longtime friend of ours from up north, she asked that question in a conversation we were having. It was a couple years ago. She was going through a difficult time. I borrowed that question as about a year and a half ago, roughly the same time, when we kicked off a Bible series that we were going to look at readings from Genesis. And in that first meeting, it's actually a brunch, which we can't wait to be doing that again. But at that first meeting, as we were preparing on that first day to look at the creation story, I started off the discussion by asking my friend's question. Why, God, did you even bother with creation? I think this is a question, or questions like it, that many of us ask, during difficult times. We really do sometimes wonder, why did God put us here? And so here we are, a year into the pandemic, and I'm certain plenty of us have asked similar questions over the last year. Because this has been a time when so many have suffered, lost loved ones, lost jobs, even lost homes, gone hungry as our food drives attest to, and been isolated and lonely, unable to even hug those who we crave and we want to hug, or looking through glass windows, dividers between grandparents and grandchildren, and missing school and missing friends, and so anxious about our health and about our relationships, too. And so, I'm guessing that that kind of question popped into many of our heads because over the past year, it popped into my own head plenty of times. Why, God, did you even bother to create us? You certainly didn't create us for this. In our first reading, as Pastor Moira said, one of the oddest stories in the entire Bible, the Israelites were basically asking, they were basically asking that question, although in a slightly different form. They were saying, why, God, did you pick us to be the chosen people? We'd like to resign now from that esteemed position. Thank you very much, but we'd rather go back to Egypt where we can get a decent meal. These kinds of questions were logical by the Israelites. They're logical by us in hard times. But then we come to the second reading from the Gospel of John. And Jesus, what he does, I think a big part of what he's doing is he's addressing these kinds of questions. And he does so with an emphatic answer. Why, God? Why are we here? Because I love you. Let's start with the first story from Numbers. One of the Bible's darkest and most mysterious and in some ways makes us uncomfortable. And in many ways is very, well, in a lot of ways it's hard to explain. Given how strange the story is, one thing that is very surprising is 
that Jesus uses that story as the introduction to his, maybe his most beautiful and faith-inspiring words. That alone tells us that we don't want to avert our eyes from that story, weird though it may be. And so the Israelites, there they were. They were well into their time wandering in the desert, and they complain. That they do that, that they complain, should not be surprising. It was a brutal time, and it went on for 40 years, and complain they did. This story today is the last of the so-called wilderness murmuring, or wilderness complaint stories. And each previous time they'd complained, they complained against Moses, and they complained against Moses' brother Aaron, basically their leaders, but this time they add God to the list. And apparently God doesn't like that, and God sends snakes, and people die. This is disturbing on so many levels. I can't fully explain that. I can only say I'm disturbed. But then the story turns positive. This time, instead of complaining, why God? The people, instead, they try something different. The people respond by confessing that they have sinned by complaining against God. And basically what they're doing is they're, 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 they're confessing that they just haven't been grateful enough for all that God had done for them. And so they pray, or they ask Moses to pray for them, asking God to take away the ser serpents. And God relents, giving Moses a remedy, a remedy that is bizarre, and it's also religiously problematic. It's a remedy that pushes against God's second commandment, to not to worship graven images. We can't pretend that it doesn't do that. It does. It makes us uncomfortable. God tells Moses to make a bronze replica, or a wooden replica, <laughs> a bronze replica of the deadly serpent and put it up on a pole so that when the people are bitten, the instructions were, just look at that serpent on a pole and you will survive. The snake, the very thing that the people fear becomes the remedy for what they fear. Now, as odd as this story is, that last point, it actually, when you think about it, it isn't that odd. I think what we have here, one way to see the story, is a reminder, and this is what Pastor Mora was saying as well, is that running from our fears is generally not not a, a great approach. What we have here is a reminder that God, no matter how lost in the wilderness we might be, and no matter what we might, how lost and how afraid we might feel, God is able to help us to deal with those things that we fear and when we're lost. This is a reminder to look up to God, to look up to God, when we're in trouble, to remember that God can deliver us in wilderness times. Not, it's a reminder not to be afraid to admit where we've gone wrong and then to ask God for help. These are very good takeaways from this very odd story. But still, Come on. We have to ask, why would Jesus begin our second reading alluding to a snake, a serpent up on a pole? That troubling image. Why, God? Why, Jesus? Frankly, I don't have a perfectly crisp answer to that. Other than to say that Jesus uses that image to point forward to that time when he like that snake, would be up, up on the cross, lifted up on the cross. He points to the cross, 
which was a troubling thing in those days. It's about the worst thing that could happen to you in the Roman Empire. Crucifixion was troubling. And so maybe we can say that Jesus, one message here is that Jesus doesn't want us to avert our eyes. Avert our eyes from the fact that we live in a hard world in which Jesus was put up on a cross. A world where bad things do happen to good people and where evil exists. But then comes the pivot. Maybe the greatest pivot of all time. In fact, I'd say definitely. It's dramatic. Jesus' next words, they are among the most beautiful and uplifting in the Christian faith. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that Whoever believes in him may not perish. So beautiful and so beautifully sung today. But still, back to that question that we human beings ask very often. Maybe especially people of faith ask it. Maybe more than others in difficult times. Why, God? Why did you create us? Why? The answer, love. One of the biggest hurdles, I believe, in the, to, to having, to building and growing faith is the hard, harsh, unfair, even cruel world and, and, and parts of life that we all see with the biggest hurdle to faith maybe is, is knowing that and at the same time despite those facts of life being able to believe that God's love is real and that God's loving promise of deliverance is real and to accept that God loves us so much that God wants to have an eternal relationship with each of us. Jesus is not, in this great, his great words, he's not trying to articulate faith. He's not trying to describe faith as sort of a panacea for living in a dangerous world where, a dangerous world where there are snakes and there are pandemics and there are injustices. Jesus, instead, he doesn't, Jesus doesn't recommend that we put on blinders to get through life. He wants us not, I think, instead, he wants us to not avert our eyes, not to hide from the things that we're afraid of. In fact, he's telling us we don't need to hide. Why? Because God loves us so much, so much. And the question is, can we trust in that love? When our kids were very little, Gregory and Allison, I think most, I think every parent plays this game. You ask the little child, how big? How big is Gregory? How big is Allison? And they look at you and then you both together go, so big, so big. Well, today we are basically asking that question. How much does God love us? And the answer, Jesus' answer is so much. So much that he gave his only son. For God so loved the world. So much that he gave his only son that we would not perish. That we would have eternal love. For God so loved the world. The world. The world, that's a lot. Loving the world means loving every one of us, even those who don't love God back. Everyone, the whole world, no matter who you are or where you are in your life journey. What, and I ask, what could be more uplifting than that? Especially in hard times. Friends, Easter is coming. 
And something to remember about Easter is that Good Friday comes first. The crucifixion comes first. Easter, in that way, Easter does not pretend that things are a piece of cake. Instead, Easter reminds us that we don't have to be so afraid. Why? Because God loved us so much, which is about the most uplifting thing that I can think of when we believe in that. Amen.